give you a little bit of feedback. Of course, it's been going fine, Ken. Had a different jockey on the weekend. Last night was very, very sore. I got the old back. Just a little bit of I was just saying the horse has been fine for a long time, but someone else rode on the weekend and he's got a sore in the lower back. Yeah. I think it's only and quite, quite often you'll get this excuse, you know, excuse, you'll see a horse and the, the owner will say, somebody else has ridden it, it's not my problem. Right? You understand that? <laughs> They'll transfer the blame onto somebody else. That's actually true though, this uh, Very interesting too, just as we start to, usually if there's a strong personality change in a horse, it's nearly always a neck related problem. Um, compared to any other part of the body, it will affect it the way they move. Uh, uh, it can be degrees of lameness, but if they've got a strong personality change, it will nearly always be from this point forward. So I guess if you liken it to ourselves, if you've got neck problem, headaches, migraines, you're less intolerant with the rest of the world, and your personality is less than wonderful. Same with these guys. I even had one for the first time the other day, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Linda Blanchard's horse. She said she, all of a sudden, uh, an endurance horse, it's starting to toss its head. I'm sure it's got a headache. And when we got up, I had a look at it on the right temple. Its temple was actually pulsating. It was a really strong throb. Oh. It was out the third vertebrae in its neck. And when we fixed that, that stopped immediately. So they do have headaches. They do have problems. And you know, it was trying to say, you know, I'm really not coping with this. But he'd also had a physical thing. I hadn't seen that throbbing ever in any other horse that was there like it. But yes, definitely, people do not attribute neck pain enough to aggro in horses. Uh, key indicators are, with, with neck discomfort, uh, a horse is nat naturally happy to be on the bridle or nose band or happy to travel in a certain position. Uh, they'll want to lift their head higher and they'll be stepping a little shorter. Because as that neck, as that becomes uncomfortable, they'll elevate that head as the shoulder steps through here, that'll catch that nerve, that'll be uncomfortable and they'll step a little shorter. So they're getting this reaction rather than a nice fluent reaction in front. And what we're saying before on those diagrams where the skeletal structure comes through a horse, comes down through here and up through the shoulder here. Even on the diagram, it, it shows the next, uh, the skeletal structure coming a lot higher than what it is. It actually sits right in under where my fingers are here, way down low in the neck. Okay. And why it's such a problem on these thoroughbreds, we have a problem around C4 and C5 right here. If you've got compression in those vertebrae there, as that shoulder up, up. as that shoulder moves forward, fifth vertebrae there, fourth vertebrae there. As that comes forward, if there's a problem right there, that's where it catches it. So when you see a horse that is calm, if you look at it in movement first before you start? Usually I don't. Uh, usually I go through the body and if I find a problem, uh, then we'll check on movement first. But usually I'll just go over and see if there's a body problem that's obvious and then we'll check for movement. Uh, the other part when we're first looking at a horse too is obviously check at overall balance. I, I probably know this horse pretty well too and I'm taking, being a bit flat. But if, if, uh, if it's an absolute new horse, we want to make sure that when we stand behind, two points of the shoulders are absolutely even on both sides, which has got a lot to do with your feet, shallow foot, boxy feet, this sort of thing, and that our hips are absolutely square on both sides. Uh, and again, when we're checking, if we think we've got a lameness issue, I'll we'll first go and look for a digital pulse, making sure that we think that our feet are okay, and checking from there upwards. So this whole area through here is interconnected, obviously. A lot of the time I'm saying things to you that are quite obvious. So, so as they say, there's left-handed, right-handed horses. Is that going by the shoulder? Uh, usually left-handed, right-handed horses are left-handed, right-handed people. Right. Um, <coughs> and, and coming from the old, the old style of tra breaking and training, we do everything on the left, left side first. You know, everything's done predominantly left. We're yep. Luckily now, <coughs> nowadays with pressure and release training, we're doing both things evenly on both sides of the body. There are certainly horses that have a dominant side. Uh, um, in, in my breaking and training, I don't know that I would say there are any more left and right, but they do have a favoured side right. that you tend to have to do a lot more suppling on that side to make sure that it becomes a balanced side. They have a favoured side. But... Well, I heard if you're 
I think it goes if the mane's falling to the right, not necessarily. Generally, that horse tends to have a bigger left hand shoulder. Yeah, yeah, <coughs> certainly. Okay, so we're just checking, I'm checking between the junction points of the vertebrae in the neck. Again, looking for any variations <coughs> and making sure they are sitting square and balanced. Looking for any change in the horse's eye. Eye will be the first thing that shows pain and discomfort and tension through the muscle. Key indicators, this horse is pretty good, just hold the head straight to the journey. And we're saying for key indicators of the stress point in the lower part of the neck here and in the lower lumbar sacral area back here. As a general rule when you're checking your own horse, this major cephalic muscle that covers the spine down here comes down through here and ties in next to the sternum between shoulder and sternum here. If this cephalic muscle, when you get to the junction of the shoulder blade right here, the cartilage of the shoulder, if you can pick up this cephalic and it's soft and pliable like this mare is here, her eye is quite calm with that, that is usually a pretty good indicator that all those five vertebrae there are okay. If that's tight or angry in any way, somewhere up in here we've got a problem. But that's usually a pretty good area to say, if this is good, then this area is going to be okay. So, checking connective tissue on the inside of the shoulder, down into the pectoral area. Up through the radial nerve, runs through the middle of the shoulder. And this <coughs> is an area that will get very tight if you've got problems with laminitis, founder, navicular, anywhere where they try to offload through the shoulder. You get a lot of tightness in these. This horse has got a little bit of coat. Uh, if you've got a really fine coated horse, you would have seen basically when my fingers come through here, the three groups of muscles tie in right where my fingers are here. If there's a strong definition line here between muscles here and here. They will get very tight through this area here when they're trying to offload for any problems through the feet. When they're nice and relaxed like she is here, usually you'll usually, I hate that generalisation word, but we're pretty good down below. And of course, when you, when you want to examine a horse, you want to make sure whether or she is standing pretty squarely. If you've got your legs forward or back, you're obviously going to stretch certain muscles more. And I'll see that start oh, to dry. Mm. We're not comfortable right there. Now that muscle, the skin there, is also starting to wrinkle up under my fingers. So up in here, we've got something that we need to have a look at. Now, have a look at the spine. Let my finger just slide through each one of those thoracic vertebrae where the skin just folds forward in the finger. The ears and eyes are also starting to go, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, right, we've got some discomfort through there as well. So we've got a combination here of a little bit of skeletal tightness as well as muscular soreness. <coughs> right, now the key indicator here that we haven't got any problems with the pelvis because the sides of that there's no nerviness around the edges of the sacroiliac joint, which is the main one that gives us major concern here. There's no problems there. So to me, there's nothing coming out over the wings of the pelvis into that hip area. So it's all got to do with lower thoracic and saddle. Quite often you'll find when you've got sacroiliac soreness, you'll have muscle soreness here because of the tension through the nerves. If it's saddle soreness, which in this case it feels like it is, there won't be any problems back here. If, if it's not saddle soreness, then the problem should come from here. If I confused you that one, I've gone about it in a reverse way. If I've got sacroiliac soreness, I will have muscle soreness here, but I will have a lot of pain right here. Right? I have no pain here. So I can investigate this really thinking that I've got a saddle related issue. Mm -hmm. no, it's not the saddle chin. It's not the saddle? No. no. Well, when so I'm talking saddle, in the, in the I'm saddle. talking about saddle and bums in saddle. It's a broad term. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to work out whose bum it is. <laughs> I'm never coming riding here again. <laughs> So we'll just make, we'll do the same on the opposite side. Through the time, I would say 70 or 80% of coal-backed horses that I would see, their problem comes from this area here. 
they've got that lower neck problem, that's what makes them buck, yeah. not, not their back problem. And mm -hmm. I think I know that purely because I find a neck problem and I fix that, then they no longer buck. Even if that happens in the transition, not all the time? Um, no, it pretty much has. A horse that is cold, so supposedly cold back has a neck issue. You fix his neck issue and he's no longer cold back. Why he's supposedly cold back and bucking is because he has a problem in that lower neck. And again, because of this tension and soreness that comes into this area here, the pectoral muscles tie onto that same connective area next to the sternum. You'll get all this tension and aggro that comes down into that pectoral area. The back of the pectorals tie onto your diaphragm right here where your girth goes. Mm -hmm. So he's inflamed through that lower neck pe pectoral area. <coughs> you tighten that girth up on that area and mm -hmm. condense his rib cage where he's already uncomfortable, he wants a pig root on you. You release all that pressure through there, he no longer wants the pig root. All of a sudden he's no longer cold back. They certainly can be cold back, but of all the horses that I see that are supposedly cold back, most of them I can fix by fixing this area here. So Kim, what is cold back? I don't know what that is. I cold back to horses bucks. So that just bucks any time? Uh, pretty much when you first get on. When you first get on. If he's still doing it an hour into the ride, uh, that's Bigger not problem. got to do with that. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's doing it because he can. Yeah, I've heard cold back, I didn't really know what it meant though. Yeah, yeah. Horse, yeah when you first get on, they yeah. have that tendency to just always want to have a bit of a back. Right here. Again, no soreness around the edge of the sacral joint. Nothing in around the stifles. Nothing into the hamstring and groin area. It's very specific to right where the back of that saddle is going to sit and that little mm -hmm. compression in the middle of the spine. So uh, to me, that's all got to be very symptomatic of a recent ride. You see the there, the are all kind of and then in your own edged. mind, you can do your training. So we don't need to push on through this. We don't have a physical problem. We've just got to go through this transitional period of something you're not used to. We're talking about stifles here. Stifles are the worst joint on the body to do anything with. Anybody that's got to do with trotters will know about that. But the Texas AM uh, University did a study about four years ago, and they said one of the best things with uh, stifle problems, one of the cheapest to start with, the worst thing you can do is actually spell them because a lot of the problem has got to do with ligament strength. So, you know, the best thing to do is to get out in the long term, you know, and try and strengthen the ligament structure up. So it's the whole that stifle from doing too much lateral movement. The stronger the ligament structure, the better it is. I mean, you do have options uh, of injecting into the ligament. Yeah, that's what they said, the options were injections and... Or surgery. Yeah, or surgery. surgery. And you you might need to do well, mo Most of the vets don't like to inject early because it can be a maturity <laughs> thing, you know, as they get to the physical. That trotting up hills and over poles and that sort of thing? This deal about trotting over poles, uh -huh. oh, I've got absolutely no faith in whatsoever, unless they're significant like cavalettis. Yeah. I mean, John Harlan, yeah. what happens most of the time is with these sacroiliac problems, you get a lateral movement through here. Yeah. <clears throat> it is. And it usually comes from horses that actually hyperextend out. So she will need, <clears throat> we put a little bit of liniment because there's a bit of bruising here, but we'll just get rid of this compression. And she knows what's going on here. Okay. I'm just blocking her head from going too far around, is that right or not? No, no you're fine right there. Now she's going to come forward here because this is not very comfortable. You're in the right position here. So we just want to lift this spine vertically because it's got downward compression. Mm -hmm. She might go forward. I see what you did, that was too quick. <laughs> so we're just picking that spine up to its highest point to get rid of the downward compression. Now it will partially stretch this dorsi muscle in that. I'm sure it's skeletal, you'll get this reaction straight away when you've got compression. Oh, that, that feels a bit better if somebody's ever had it work done themselves. They don't necessarily feel good the moment they do it, but once that pressure comes out of there, you'll get the bottom lip to drop, you get the top eyelid to go sort of half asleep, and you get this, this immediate back legs will start to relax like so. See the eyelid there now? Yeah, that's much better.